Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining me on Sarvagun Sampan. I'm your host, Anu. It's my privilege to bring forth women of Indian origin, women of the diaspora, and share their stories with all of you. I hope you make this an important part of your self-care routine and read from the book of life of another woman. Understand her strengths, her values, her journey, her life experiences, and how she takes care of herself. Because this is what truly empowers each one of us when we take the time to acknowledge and appreciate the women who are all around us. They're not celebrities, but they are nonetheless heroes of their own right. Their impact on the community, their contribution to their families, their workplaces, the society around them is making a difference. I hope you will continue on this journey in 2024 with me. And my goal is to spotlight these incredible role models who are all around us. If you could share this with the women in your network. And also, if you have young daughters, these episodes will really help them get a perspective on life and so many other things. So thank you so much for joining me. My guest today is a woman who values service, integrity, accountability, inclusiveness, and resilience. And her strengths include her high level of motivation, her self-awareness, her resilience, her belief and trust in humanity and systems thinking. Please join me in welcoming Deepa Vedavyas to the show. Deepa, it's great to have you. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much, Anu. It's an absolute pleasure to join you in this. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey just seeing you launch this and uh, traveling with you and, you know, all the other guests that you've been having um, over the course of, you know, several months now. I have thoroughly enjoyed listening to the beautiful journey each and every one of uh, them had to share and uh, the wisdom, you know, through their lived experiences. Um, I think uh, it's it's truly a great service that you're, uh, you have embarked on and I'm very appreciative of that. Thank you so much for saying that, uh, Deepa. It really means a lot to me. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to be my guest. Uh, the feathers in my cap, I'd say, are all the glorious women that are coming and gracing the show. You said it. It's so much to learn out there from each and every one of them. And uh, I'm having a great time. I'm just enjoying myself. And I cannot wait to learn more about you learn about your journey, learn about your background, and um, really uncover so many facets. We What we see on social media is just the tip of the iceberg. But, um, you know, the, the incredible achievements, struggles, and challenges, and everything that you've been through, that's what I'm here to uncover. So thank you once again for joining me, and let's get started. Our first segment on this show, which is broken up into five parts, is about your childhood. We call it Bachpan Ke Din. Uh, please take us back in time, and let's uncover the childhood of Deepa Vidavyas. So, Bachpan Ke Din Deepa. Absolutely. And um, again, it's it's always a joy to go back in time and to relive uh, many of those memories once again. And I appreciate you providing this opportunity for me today. So, again, I am originally from Tamil Nadu um, in the southern part of India uh, from the town called Krishnagiri. And uh, of the many things it's known for, um, you know, beautiful mountains surrounding the uh, the town, uh, the granite, uh, you know, multitude of colored uh, of granite that it's known for. Mangoes is one that really tops the list. Uh, uh, the town is really very well known for its variety of mangoes that it, um, you know, gets to send all across the country. So again, I grew up with this amazing mix of natural resources and man-made resources all around me. So thanks to the, the dam that we had, you know, which was a natural uh, uh, breath of fresh air for us to, you know, any day we choose to go anywhere, it was the, the KRP dam that uh, was, in our, uh, was in our town. Again, growing up, I grew up in an in a affluent, uh, you know, a joint family uh, system. I come from a family of three generations of lawyer, including my brother and sister-in-law. Now they are into the fourth generation. So again, um, I have had an amazing time growing up, uh, looking at role models right 
in my household and you know extended families and people who have become our families you know just by means of you know working uh, in our offices and uh, coming for internships and apprenticeship with my father because our house was um, kind of like the first part of the house in the front as you enter uh, they were all offices law offices and then you you basically have to enter through the office to get to the household so it was like those old traditional system where uh, you have the house and the office space uh, in the same premise so that's kind of how I grew up so again uh, my dad was working and I could see him work and there was no restrictions of me going and sitting and doing my homework while my dad is working in his office so it was a very uh, fluid kind of an environment where I have seen my grandfather uh, literally being a you know, man of principle and discipline because even today as I was recollecting um, I look at the clock and I can tell precisely you know what he would be doing that's the type of discipline he had five o'clock he would be up you know he would make his uh, lemon and honey water by himself in the kitchen six it will be his yoga time and uh, you know after yoga is his ragi malt like you know and so on so again he lived this amazing self-disciplined lifestyle but just because he was so disciplined he never really influenced or tried to change all of us in the household you know that was a beauty I felt you know that my grandfather kind of you know he displayed you know through his um, you know right kind of uh, practices in the household but again he never really forced any of us to be like him so he let all of us be ourselves which I thought was really beautiful and grandma again she always came across as a stern yet a very brave women of those time, um, especially in those days, women uh, known to be, you know, kind of subtle in expressing their voices and so on. But I've never seen my grandma do that. She was always out there expressing her opinions. You know, he, she was always extremely brave, even though she only had completed 10th grade, her English was so fine. And, you know, she would just speak so fluently and with people who would come from, you know, the office space, you know, whenever my grandfather had people come over, they would also come into the household and we all got a chance to experience and talk to them as well. Many times growing up, I did not even know that, you know, they were senior officials in government or Supreme Court judges. So there'll be black cats, you know, inside in the our living room. I didn't, we never knew me and my brother, I have a younger brother. So it was always like, you know, we were only introduced and, you know, as a person, as an individual. So we never were told this person is so-and-so and this is what they do or like their leadership. So we were never asked to dress up a certain way or behave a certain way because somebody else is coming to the house. So again, so that I think had such a long lasting impact on some of the personalities that I, I think me and my brother has developed because of that very reason, you know, of, you know, I think subtly they said that we were enough without really telling to us. So I think as a child, we got into talking to people, interacting with folks without really having those barriers. So I think that has come a long way. Even today, when I look back, I do not have the reservations when I speak to people. I, you know, I don't, their title or their position do not come to my mind as a first thought. It's only their nature and I connect with them and their humanness. I think that is a gift that my grandparents and my parents have given. And um, yeah, again, mom is ever loving. Like she was always a few steps ahead of all of us in her thought and her vision. She was always well caught up with the newspapers, even though she was a teenage mom, like, you know, having me very early on in her life, she would always, you know, tell us that, you know, this is what is coming in terms of career pathway. You know, why don't you explore uh, this type of technology? Why don't you explore learning this course? And uh, in fact, to a point where she actually taught my brother how to cook first, even though he was younger to me, than teaching me, because she would say you would eventually learn, but it's, you know, it's up to me to teach him how to, you know, be self-sufficient. And, uh, you know, but she would always emphasize that as a woman, you really need to have all the tools that you need to stand on your own if you choose to. You can always choose to stay at home, but again, you I would expect you to be productive at all times, no matter where you are, be of used to the society that you are you're you are in it, it doesn't matter where it is but again you have to be meaningful and you have to have a purpose in life so that was something that I really you know I think that really shaped me uh, growing up and my dad again was man of words like you know if, if my dad says six o'clock we are leaving to this place rain or shine me and my brother knows that that's going to happen 
So he, it's his, if it's something comes out of his mouth, it's a promise. So that's the level of, you know, integrity and, you know, kind of a uh, man of words he was and uh, very spiritual too. Like, you know, he always surrendered to God and had that utmost faith uh, that, you know, the universe would take care of things. So he never really stressed out too much about uh, the, uh, what, what the chaos of the life was and so on. I think, you know, those are all some of the things that I recollect. And um, growing up uh, in terms of schooling itself, I would, um, from what I hear from my mom, that I used to be an extremely naughty uh, person uh, in the sense that I think it also comes with the fact that in a joint family system, you're expected to behave a certain kind of way and in a certain kind of, you know, unsaid rules and regulations. So I think school was my escape. So I was just, you know, being myself, you know, being my free spirit um, in school, like, you know, most of the complaints that you would get is like, either I'm too talkative or like, you know, I'm just uh, disrupting the class by, you know, uh, talking to friends or whatever. So those kind of things, but I was always good at studies too. So I, I would get away with uh, some of those, but I think um, those were some of the things that my mom always would say that, you know, I, I always dreaded coming to the lunchtime because, you know, your teacher would always have one or two complaints about you. And uh, that being said, uh, my mom was also, she grew up in Delhi for until middle school. So she was also an athlete. Um, so she had done marathons and things like that when she was uh, young. So me and my brother, every single day, you know, even on weekends, we have to hit the ground. You know, my parents would run with us. So six o'clock, we have to hit the ground. So my father would time me. So I would, you know, I would have to run 100 meters. Um, and then we would make um, rounds in the girls high school, like which is the public school system that's open um, playground for us to uh, exercise and things like that. So every single day, my dad and my mom, would, you know, we'll, we would all four of us would go to a point where we used to be known as a running family, which is very unusual in a small town, like, you know, family of four running in the, in the ground. So I actually was an athlete too, um, up until my 10th grade, I represented the school in relay and uh, 200 meters uh, in, the, in the division level, uh, never really got up to the state level. Uh, but again, you know, a local district division uh, was where, how I went. And um, yeah, that's kind of, uh, I also had a very interesting affinity towards animals. My my grandparents and my parents would not allow us to have pets in the household. Uh, but I figured out a way, you know, how to fulfill that. Um, we had beautiful coconut trees surrounding our homes. So we would always have monkeys in the morning time, like around 15 to 20 of them would go around six o'clock, would walk on our terrace. And same time around five o'clock in the evening, they would walk like about 20, 25 of them would walk. So I would tell my mom, I'm going upstairs to study. And basically I would pack a lot of snack with me <laughs> and go upstairs. I, I was not scared. I don't know why, but all the monkeys would surround me and, you know, they would kind of play with my hair, you know, take the snacks from me. I'll be surrounded by monkeys. So they knew me and I kind of had a bond. So, you know, I kind of fulfilled my desire to have pets by interacting with monkeys. And my pastime or my uh, secret hideout was climbing on roofs and climbing on trees. So, you know, anytime I just needed a break, I would just go upstairs in the terrace and climb on, you know, multiple levels and then go to the water tank. There was no staircase or anything. I would just climb on the wall. I don't know how I did it. But, um, you know, those were all type of things that I would do and still get away. <laughs> so it was it was funny. But, uh, you know, thinking back, I think uh, I found my own way of uh, energizing and entertaining myself. Um, those are all such uh, interesting memories. And 11th and 12th, I moved to um, a boarding school in Erode. So I think that was the first experience out of home uh, because we didn't really have a lot of uh, good schools in the, in the town that I grew up. Um, as I said, we only had two English medium schools. Um, so uh, there were not really uh, great schools for 11th and 12th grade. Um, so I was sent off to boarding school. So my memories in my household was until my 10th grade. And um, they still are very much uh, evergreen. And, you know, there's nothing to complain there, right? Um, so what if you missed out on great schools uh, living in such a fantastic and fun place like you grew up in, the town that you grew up in, and uh, surrounded by not just the nature, not just, uh, you know, life as it happened, but amazing role models in your grandparents and your parents and your aunts and uncles. Just the delight of growing up in a joint family um, is something that, like, I always believe, you know, it's it, it's almost unrelatable 
to kids in this generation. Um, and for you to emulate and learn from all of them, although back then you were just taking all of it in without any regard to the learning part of it. But now when you look back, you know, that's where your values came from. That's where, you know, your uh, personality was really shaped. That was the foundation. And uh, what I really love about what you said was, uh, uh, you know, too much importance was not attached to the titles. And, you know, regardless of all the important positions that people held, um, you were always asked to focus on, you know, who people were. And I think that is just such a great great um, learning. So thank you so much for sharing these fun aspects about your life, Deepa. Um, I, you know, just that whole episode with monkeys and spending time on the terrace must have been such a blast. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it sounds like great fun. All right, um, let's continue on. Um, and this is the onward journey. Ye kaha gai hum. Uh, what happened after high school, 12th grade onwards, all the way till present day? So we, we cover a long span. Uh, but this is where uh, life really happens. And so we'll try to unfold that. Absolutely. Thank you, Anu. So right after high school, um, again, I was I was good at math and computer science, though my scores in computers were much higher. Um, so the reason I bring that up is because like as we applied uh, for colleges, um, you know, as a backup, like, you know, I had applied, I had come, I had done my engineering entrance exams, and then I had also applied for um, courses in a bachelor's in math and bachelor's in computer science um, in the arts college locally, while I was waiting for the scores uh, for the engineering entrance exams to come up. So I joined um, a women's uh, college, um, and I started doing computer science, because I was good in coding. Uh, but even though comparatively, I loved math better than um, computer science. So I, I joined in a in a college locally by then um, the scores of the entrance exam for the engineering came out and um, my uh, desire was actually to do architecture and uh, because that desire came when uh, you know when I came across my uncle my uh, my chitti my aunt's husband who is an architect practicing in Delhi so you know I looked um, at his office, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time at this office and uh, his work when I was in a 10th grader. So naturally, I picked up an interest in architecture. And I was also creative uh, in my own ways. I used to do soap carving and, you know, anything I could find, I would try to create uh, something out of it. So I thought maybe that would fit in with my personality and also nurturing my free uh, spirit. And I love to travel. So I think architecture inherently had that in the curriculum to kind of component of travel. Um, as you learn about different styles of architecture and things like that. So I pursued that and I joined um, in Huzur in Adiman College of Engineering. That's where, uh, unlike in the US, architecture is part of the engineering college. Um, so again, you know, we had to, uh, it was not anything locally that was available. So I had to travel like two hours and bus every day, uh, one way uh, to get to the college and come back. So my day would start as early as 6 a.m. in the morning. And, um, you know, I would come back and pretty much as, as many who are had an exposure to architecture knows that we work night outs, like, you know, long nights and days creating models and creating designs and uh, so on. But that was a very fascinating uh, experience. Just the idea of starting with a blank canvas or a blank slate and actually creating and throwing in your creativity and, you know, literally not having any boundaries or limitations kind of go in with the space that you're offered to design really taught a lot as an individual and a personality like you know uh, to just imagine and dream you know many of us in our childhood are robbed you know don't have not everybody you know having come a long way in in life you know i realized that dreams is such a you know the ability to dream is such a gift and um, I think that was provided to me through college, you know, in, in the courses that I did. And uh, I think it was the internship was a life changer for me. I did my internship in uh, Ahmedabad under architect Meenakshi Jain and Kulbushan Jain. Uh, they were, you know, uh, in fact, nationally renowned architects for their conservation of Nagor Fort, Meherangar Fort, the Jod Jodhpur Fort, and um, even, um, you know, a lot of urban planning projects like Surat Master Plan and those kind of things, uh, which I had an exposure to actually be in the fort premise and work on and be there as a, as ma'am was doing uh, master planning projects for Surat master plan. Um, so again, that's when I saw a, a very strong women leader, women architect, um, you know, completely like taking charge and, you know, 
creating this beautiful marvel in, in as small as a center table design to creating you know a beautiful structure to a city like Surat. So she was working in all scales, which was something that really opened up my eyes. And that's when I felt that you know while it was important for me to design within the uh, the boundary of the site that was given to me, um, context started becoming more relevant to me. You know, I felt like, you know, just I did not want to be kind of forcing myself to design within the siloed, just the site. So I wanted to in, know more about the site and the context. So that's when I took my thesis for my architecture as an urban planning project, you know, and back in the days, mine was the first or the second in the in the university that they gave a special exception to do a study project because architects are not allowed to do study projects like planners um but i convinced them that i need to do this you know historic temple precinct and uh, i would come up with a design proposal but without studying the context i cannot propose what's to come so um that really opened me up i would say that you know that just studying the existing conditions of the space you know what is the need you know what is the transformation the space the historic present has gone through over the time period because you know time is a beautiful element in our lives so again like you know the architecture is so connected to that um again that really set me off to a different path you know away from architecture i did not know then so I finished my architecture. I did my thesis in urban planning of a Kapalishwara temple precinct in, in, in Chennai. You know, that was a project that I took. And uh, right after that, you know, during the time, even before I defended my thesis, I got engaged. Uh, my parents, uh, you know, were particular. I was a, the first granddaughter in both sides, both maternal and paternal side. So I was the oldest um, in the family. So they felt that, you know, uh, everybody were very anxious and very uh, eager and participating in my life decisions. So I think, uh, you know, that's kind of how uh, I ended up meeting Veda, uh, Vyas, uh, my husband, and we had a very informal uh, kind of meetup in Chennai and uh, led to multiple full conversations. And um, right after graduation, we got uh, married in August. And by then he was also posted in the US. He had worked for a year in the US and during the engagement, uh, we were in India. And that was one of my conditions that, you know, I wanted to marry somebody who is in India because I want to stay closer to my parents, you know, not that I knew any, any other country then. So I wanted to stay closer to my family, having grown up so so uh, close knit with my family. But right after the engagement, he was posted in the US. So none of us had control over it. And again, um, I just went with the flow. I, you know, I just um, we got married and uh, came here in two thousand one. And uh, initial days were a huge struggle uh, because right after college, I come here on a dependent visa. Unlike now, the dependent visas did not allow you to work. It allowed you to study, but not work. And um, Veda was also starting up in his career. He didn't, we didn't have enough to send me off to college. You know, colleges was so expensive in the US, so I couldn't, you know, start off. So again, that's kind of, uh, you know, for the first six months, it was very difficult. And uh, that's when I decided, you know, one day that either I'm going to, spend the rest of my time cribbing about the condition that I'm in and feel sorry for myself or make a list of things to do that I'm going to, you know, I always wanted to do, but never had a chance. And first and top of the list was enrolling myself in tennis school. Um, I always wanted to play tennis uh, because my grandfather, my father, everybody, all the males in my family were tennis players. So I grew up going to the tennis courts, uh, but I, I never really uh, played. So I enrolled myself in a, in a tennis school. In, in Tampa, we, I mean, luckily we landed in Tampa, so that was the first place. So I did a nine months of tennis school, um, you know, with, with a coach who was training then Wimbledon Junior Championships, a champion, so people would come with interpreters and, you know, things like that. So I, I did not know how fortunate I was to learn from uh, Steve. Um, so it was a very beautiful experience. So again, I had a list of things in my to-dos. So doing masters was one. Um, so I would go to Barnes and Nobles, which is such a beautiful thing that the US has, like these bookstores so accessible you don't really you know you can spend hours together no you know they're not going to say you know leave this place with that if you don't buy the book or anything like that so I would spend like on an average like five hours a day um in Barnes and Nobles uh pretty much like picking whatever book I wanted and you know I would I would I would uh, just study and slowly I started preparing on my own for GRE and I took my GRE and TOEFL and had those uh done to be ready for applying for master's you know Fate had a different turn, you know, I, uh, again, Veda had to move from Tampa. So then uh, he moved to St. Louis, I followed along. 
and uh, we had our first child. So I had to put all my uh, master's plan on hold, but I never thought it's not going to happen. Though. That was, I think it was a blessing. I feel, you know, just because things happen in my life, I never, I always felt that it's just a postponement. It's not really an end all to your goal. So I knew I would finish my master's. I just knew that it was not then. So I was like, okay, I didn't think about it too much. I was in the moment, um, you know, but I went through a very, very high risk pregnancy. Um, so it, it was, it was too complicated uh, of a pregnancy for me. And uh, I was admitted almost 14, 15 times in the emergency. And, you know, I was, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a rough ride. And uh, once Sanjana came and she was a healthy child, you know, we were so thankful. So I was there enjoying every day, you know, I would spend pretty much every day revolved around her. I didn't think about, oh, I'm, you know, I'm home. I'm not, you know, able to study or anything like that. I was just living my fullest to the present and the present moment. And when we took her for the first uh, year, um, you know, celebrations to India, that's when my mom said, you know, you know, think about it. If you want to study, I told my mom, I only have like one and a half year more before the GRE runs out. Like it has a time period, five years, you know, before which you need to kind of apply. Um, and that's when Veda said, you know, you have been there, for me throughout all my, uh, you know, steps um, of my journey. So I, I want to completely support you. If you want to do study now, whatever decision you need to take, wherever you want to go, I'll be there. So I thought that was a beautiful thing. Both my mom and my husband were supportive. Uh, my mom said she would take care of the child. My baby was like 14 or 16 month old. It was a very tough decision. But when I was in India is when I applied, uh, when I was visiting, then I applied for six schools and I got into five. And then whatever came first, I took, um, which was a Virginia, uh, Richmond, Virginia, Virginia Commonwealth University. And it was urban planning, uh, the course that I wanted uh, because I wanted to be a city planner. So I took that course and my mom uh, took care of Sanjana, my older child, um, for two years uh, while I was studying. And Veda was in a different state. So we would only meet once a week, only on the weekends. And he never missed a weekend. He would travel four hours one way just to see me and be with me. And mom would come once a year bringing the baby um so again it was a 48 credit course um with plus four credit internship um i was a workaholic i worked 15 hours a day on an average all day throughout two years i did three jobs um you know uh, mostly relevant to the course um because that way i can figure out my likes and dislikes so what i mean by that is planning is such a vast field so urban planning. So I kind of, you know, did five internships, even though only one internship was required. So it allowed me to narrow down the places that I did not see myself in my career path. So I was doing the elimination round, so to speak, on, you know, getting to clarity on where my passion lies. So finally, it was in the community development, you know, that that just clicked. That was the last internship I did. And I was like, this is it. You know, I need to be in the midst of the community, working and serving um, in the community. So that's kind of, you know, I came, you know, full circle from architecture to urban planning to community development. And right after graduation, we, we moved to Cleveland. Um, you know, that's kind of uh, uh, where I landed. Um, and in, in Cleveland is our fifth city, you know, overall since we started in Tampa. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that uh, journey and um, how Cleveland has now become our home. What a fabulous journey you've had uh, starting out of your uh, high school. Life had different plans, but uh, you were consistent in your ability to stay focused on the moment, being in the moment and being resilient. So whatever came your way, um, the way you um, accepted that and uh, never got negative, always stayed positive, stayed focused. That's that's fantastic. I have a lot of questions about your job um, and that really helps us segue into our next segment, which is Kam Ki Baat. And here, I cannot wait to learn about urban planning. You know, uh, what are the things that are involved? Which are the organizations that you can be part of uh, as an urban planner? And are we just talking about, uh, when you talk about city planning, urban planning, are we focused on downtowns or are we also looking at uh, suburban areas? Uh, how does it all play out? It's a fascinating field. We've not had any guest on the show that's got this background. So this is a very special one. I'd love to learn more. Yes, absolutely. I know this is such a, you know, to me, you know, I'm, I'm in love with the field of urban planning, uh, mainly because it, uh, it allows you to connect every aspect of your life to your work. Because as a planner, you know, you, you have a very unique way of interacting with spaces around you, both, you know, uh, 
immediately around you and also further down because you are continuously taught to think both short term short range planning and long range planning as a planner one can choose um, either or as they feel because you know it depends on what connects with you because if you are purely focused on long range planning there are so many local government institutions like the department of transportation for instance or the state housing development authority for instance so again there are so many uh, or like the federal you know like fema disaster management so for instance so again those are all long range planning like which is completely purely focused on long range the housing like the aging plan aging in transport because we have a lot of aging population we can't just think about uh, wo- the workforce the people in the workforce we have to think about people who are not yet born people who are in you know in this education system what is their pathway what is their um, what is the infrastructure that the city or uh, the town holds for them to create a pipeline and how do we retain the talent you know it's one thing is to attract the talent through universities and you know creating all these uh, amazing institutions but how do you retain the talent you know again that becomes um, uh, thinking that you know as a planner you have to think in systems in all aspects not just the infrastructure uh, purely based on the physical infrastructure like the water sewer uh, management uh, or the roads infrastructure Um, and those kind of things so again like you know planning is comprehensive for the most part like it depends on uh, one chooses to focus primarily on comprehensive planning or some even goes into the legal side of planning where you talk about the ordinances and the laws um, that kind of are put in place so the city can uh, stay and be more efficient as a system so again there are different ways and government is certainly one one area one sector that you know you can go into and within that you have local state federal and you know uh, even regional government entities that um, hires planners and um, and planner being such a sought out profession um, in community development because there are a lot of non profits cleveland is a phenomenal ecosystem cleveland and the cuyahoga county and our region northeast ohio in general is got the is extremely rich in non profits um, so again i think um, that really creates multitude of options for uh, planners to go into the field of non profit and there are also for profits or like um consultancy firms that really hires planners so you can go into both um you know kind of business side of things working for large architecture firms or planning firms you know being a consultant being an urban design urban planner urban designer uh, kind of roles as well uh, going purely into design is also an option um you know depending on where you go so again for me um the first job as soon as i came to cleveland because i knew that i had narrowed down my priority towards community development so that is the only place i looked because i during my internship in college i did for local government for the county i worked for a very small town of summerfield in north carolina where only three planners were there i was one of the three planners so it was a very small setting like you know rural planning so that is again an option so again i did in the virginia housing development authority as an intern i also practiced as a intern in uh, uh, the department of transportation state department of transportation which was completely long range plan so finally when i did the community development that's when i realized that you know i not only did i like planning for long range but i also wanted to see it be implemented you know i wanted to be part of the solution be part of the process so that's where the community development played a big role because i didn't want to kind of design and create a plan that somebody else would implement or like you know i would not be part of the process 20 30 years down the road so that was just a personal preference so again everybody has a different interest so again once you figure out what type of planner do you see yourself as an economic development planner do you see yourself as an environmental planner so it depends on the type of planning um area of uh, specialty that you have an interest i think uh, one can easily narrow down and um again i've always seen planning as something that you can continue to keep on exploring and going deeper so i started off as a community development professional in working in one of the southeast side neighborhoods in cleveland the buckeye neighborhood one of the most uh, disinvested neighborhoods you know within the city of cleveland um i think you know one thing that i truly owe 
you know, to my professionals, also the fact that serving in one of those um, uh, much needed community where my job itself become a service, you know, that was something that I was very particular about because I was doing weekend service projects with my husband and family members through the Satya Sai organization that I'm very much part of, um, but that was not enough. So that's what drew me to the Bakai neighborhood while I was in that thinking that I'm actually going and serving the community, what in turn happened was the community really shaped me to a better human being, you know, made me a better person, better human being. Actually, it was a service that they gave me, you know, um, but it was almost, um, you know, I, I, I just came back receiving more from the community than I, I believe I've, I've given, but that's something that I owe to the community. And uh, after that, I moved on to, um, teaching briefly. Uh, so I was in the, I was a visiting faculty. So I, I loved interacting with the next gen, you know, and trying to kind of be in that energy and the spirit and continuously be challenged in your thoughts and ideas was something that I enjoyed um, through those interactions when I was uh, teaching. And I then landed my job in the local government as a sustainability manager for the city of Cleveland in the mayor's office, um, which was again, a beautiful role because by then my first job, I narrowed down my interest area to sustainability because I, uh, you know, that is where my passion started taking me towards in my first job. And uh, it's almost been 12 to 15 years since I've been very much em embedding sustainability in my, in my roles and thinking and my uh, doing. So um, I also served in the, in the philanthropic institution. Cleveland is very fortunate to have a lot of uh, generous people um, in the in the community and Cleveland Foundation, uh, not many know, um, is the world's first community foundation founded in 1914. And um, now we have over close to 2000 community foundations around the world. And um, being founded in 1914, like we have a long standing legacy of serving and responding to the community needs and um, the the impact that it has left in the community is uh, is truly phenomenal and outstanding. I consider myself fortunate for having been in different roles and different organizations um, that I've been so far. And I'm also happy to share that I've accepted my new role as the first director of resiliency and sustainability for NOPEC, which is a Northeast Ohio Public Energy Council. I will be starting in January and as their first um, uh, first director in this uh, role, uh, focusing primarily on sustainability. Uh, thank you so much for so succinctly laying out the path um, of your journey as an architect, as a planner. Uh, it, it is incredible you know, to hear the amount of experience that you have gained um, through your exposure to all the various um, organizations, you know, the facets that um, make up what we call urban planning. So a uh, lot of collaboration, I assume, from different agencies, and uh, that is truly at the heart of systems change. Um, what are uh, some elements of systems change that uh, make it easy or difficult for you to do what you're doing? Because I would imagine as a planner, you are very hands-on. You are um, you're looking, like you said, in, in the context of things, um, you know, if there, if there's a, let's say, for example, an opportunity corridor, if that has to be designed, you know, there's both the short term and the long term uh, thinking that needs to be incorporated. And correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm trying to get a sense uh, from a, a very common a layman's perspective, right? So what kind of uh, barriers do you encounter in your job where you are tasked with something very specific that you have to achieve? And then you are working with so many different organizations that all have a stake, that have their skin in the game as far as planning goes. And I can only imagine, like, you know, uh, you, you're thinking about so many different things, not just, uh, you know, what's happening right now, but down the road, how it's going to have an impact. So uh, I don't know if that question makes sense to you, but I uh, would definitely like to hear a little more in terms of, um, you know, the, the work that you do, the meat and potatoes of what you do. Absolutely. And that's such a great question. Um, and honestly, the reason I say that is as a sustainability professional, um, you know, it's always in the back of my mind. It's not the what you see uh, in front of your eyes that unfolds that really is um, a biggest 
uh, area of focus for me. The reason I say that is because most often it's the unintended negative consequences of your decisions that you take um, as a sustainability professional or as a planner that has the significant, you know, either positive or negative impact in the community that you serve. Uh, what do I mean by that? Like, you know, for example, we all know that, you know, there's a huge movement towards decarbonization or towards renewable energy and, you know, towards solar and, you know, push towards all of those, um, you know, uh, more efficient um, uh, means of uh, our our lifestyle, right? You know, to be, to reduce the carbon emission and the greenhouse gas emissions um, for for uh, not just our generation, but also to do what's in the best interest of the future generation. So as we talk about those expansion, as we talk about this renewable energy targets and you know, all those um, meeting of those clean energy needs, what happens is we, we are in definite need of more and more land for expansion of solar farms. And we are in need of so much more minerals um, to create and you know, to, for manufacturing these solar panels or batteries and you know, all those, um, you know, the supply chain, so to speak, that comes with it. But again, for example, if I were in a role, um, like I was uh, previously in a role as a senior program officer, where I would be giving away the money uh, for the right causes and the impacts. For example, you know, if I were to do my job right, you know, I, if there is a need, a grantee partner comes in requesting grants for a renewable energy project, for example. So you provide them the grant, you know, by not just asking about what their goals and visions and where their organization stability is in all those things. But I think if I were to think the big picture and make sure that my unintended negative consequences has to be limited or reduced, I would ask the following additional questions. Like, where do you intend to source the solar panels from? Is it coming locally or is it coming from out of state? Do you know what practices do they engage in? Like, you know, what do I mean by that? Like, do they have a buyback policy of those panels? You know, or once it's the life is done, you know, where do they discard it? And are they mining in a more sustainable practice? Are they focusing on mining their minerals and securing those type of minerals in a more sustainable mined farm? Or is it coming from anywhere that doesn't really pay attention to those practices? So again, if we do not pay attention to what is currently happening, history could repeat itself very well after so many decades if attention is not paid. So again, like we cannot just be close-sighted in our thinking, okay, so I make this grant, you go buy the solar, you install, and we have moved towards a clean energy pathway, not really paying attention to where the sourcing is, you know, what is the pathway, what is the journey? So I think that is the responsibility as a systems thinker, each and every one of us should have, like, you know, what is the footprint or the negative impact that you're leaving and how minimal is the footprint? Mm -hmm. So again, that's that's where the challenge for me is day in and day out. What question am I not asking? Yeah. Fantastic, very well explained. Thank you so much. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, responsibility, right? Because every action of yours, every decision of yours has it has the potential of um, both positive and negative consequences. And like you said, you know, you really have to be watchful of that footprint that you're creating. And, uh, you know, uh, all, there's a lot of criticism against systems thinking, systems change, because things go very, very slowly. Um, but again, you have to consider the impact um, of all these different things in any of your decisions. So it's not an easy job. You've got to be a great collaborator. You've got to, like you said, ask the right questions because on that depends the success of your planning. So uh, brilliant. Thank you so much for addressing that. And I'd love to know uh, a little more about your uh, future role, uh, what you're, you know, you're starting a job in January. So Hati, congratulations on that one. Um, what are you going to be doing specifically in that role? And, uh, you know, how do you feel prepared uh, based on your stellar background and experiences? What do you think um, are some of the things that you will directly take to the job? Sure. Um, again, I, as in any role, like, you know, I go in with a level of openness to learning. And um, because many times it's not even the outcome of what, you know, is expected It's the process. You know, that's, that's where I like to focus, you know, because every organization has its own way of doing things. I think I'm really excited about learning what NOPEX 
uh, style of doing is and what what is their long term vision you know how do you how do uh, they when they say they is like the you know the leadership vision you know what is the vision they see one for this role um, in terms of moving more sustainably because nopec has established reputation uh, in the region since their inception over 20 years now but i think their intentionality um, now is something that i truly appreciate is um, what has led them to create this position uh, primarily to focus on resiliency and sustainability uh, while um, nopec has served as this largest um, governmental retail energy aggregator in the country where they go on behalf of the cities and townships to get the best energy pricing possible and uh, bring it back and serving across 20 counties now in northeast ohio i think they have a strong foundation that they have built um, and a foundation of trust and relationship so um trying to fit in within the values of that while also being very clear sighted of uh, the type of things uh, that we we have an opportunity to create in this time and age in uh, in the ecosystem of pushing more and having this bold ideas and goals towards uh, sustainability and uh, not really being very conservative in your thinking because conservative is not really going to meet um, the the need um, uh, as we move towards uh, decarbonizing our systems uh, so again i think it's it's important that uh, we look at not just the best interest uh, of the position itself like or the person individual's talent or role i think it's got to be a combination of best interest of the communities that we serve it's got to be the combination of best interest of the organization and also are we maximizing the person's ability and the um, and the potential that they bring in and giving them that enough uh, space or blank canvas so to speak to create um, you know their own pathway and trust them for their leadership and the and uh, the experience that they bring to lead uh, lead the organization the way i think we are starting off in a great uh, great space uh, coming in with a you know with a level of respect and trust um, for each other so i think i'm really excited and looking forward um, you know to really be able to impact much, much more uh, significantly uh, in the communities we serve uh, through this new role. And again, being um, the first of a kind role that they are created, I think there's a lot of excitement um, both within the organization and uh, you know, from my end uh, in terms of being able to work collaboratively and really push the horizons and, and the boundaries and achieving um, things that we can um, with the communities. Excellent. You know, I, I think um, they found the, uh, an absolutely great talent to do the job. Uh, you've got your um, uh, heart in the right place. You're very service oriented and, uh, you know, putting that community first, putting um, sustainability at the heart of everything and making sure that, um, you know, you're not just a person going into the role with skills and qualifications, but most importantly, a vision. And um, they couldn't have found somebody better than you just based on everything I've heard. And I'm sure my audience will concur with that. Uh, it is fascinating. Wish you all the very best for your uh, new role and uh, looking forward to uh, some great things coming out of uh, NOPEC. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that information. Deepa, we will now move on to our next segment, which is your X Factor. And here I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your personality and uh, what is it that drives you? Thank you so much for your best wishes and kind words, Anu. Yeah, I think for me, my X factor, I would say, is um, you know, constantly pushing and trying to be mindful and living in the present. Um, because by doing that, I've always noticed that my appreciation for the people who I am with in that moment really um, intensifies. And also it brings, uh, you know, I, I think uh, just the feeling of uh, being right there in the moment really allows me to uh, be fully present and focused um, on things that um, 
that drives me, right? You know, it's the purpose in life. I think um, I've always had this outlook towards life. Um, and I I keep saying that, you know, uh, even within the household that I like to now, I know I like to navigate life like water. You know, I just like to keep flowing, you know, you know, obstacles may come and go. That's just part of life. So I think it's, it's important for me to just keep moving, you know, just keep flowing and be that life force that touches on things that, you know, comes across my life, you know, the impact that I talk about, be it my personal life or my professional life. And um, also one thing that has really helped me um, in my life is trying to kind of compartmentalize my goals, right, you know, as my personal goals, my professional goals, and my family goals. Um, I think that also puts me in a place where I do not feel guilty when I indulge myself more into my personal goal, like, you know, taking care of myself, taking pauses, you know, quitting my job a month in advance before joining the new job. Like, yes, I will not have the paycheck, but, you know, that's something that I, you know, I had to do for myself. You know, that's my personal goal. That's something that I owe to myself. And my, you know, professional goals, I'm still in grad school, I'm doing my second master's right now. So again, like, yes, that's an extra chunk of money that, you know, could go towards family expense or my daughter's dance classes or music classes. But no, that's going towards my education, because I feel that, you know, that's a priority. You know, that's something that I have to do for myself, because I have always feel that there's so much in this world that I do not know. And um, I cannot waste time. Uh, so time is something that I cherish. Uh, so much that that's one thing that makes me guilty if I if I don't maximize my time in my day. So I think that's uh, one thing. And I also pauses in life are very important. Um, I we don't give enough importance to them, but I think consciously um, taking pauses in life, like you know, slowing down. You know, there was a period of time where uh, I was in the peak of my career in my early 30s. I got a job as an executive director, and I did not take up the position. But I instead, I chose to move back to India in 2013 till 19. So that was my period of pause. You know, but again, I came back much more, uh, adding more tools to my toolbox. You know, I was, you know, I was very proud housewife. You know, while I was doing a few voluntary things and also was a visiting professor twice a week and so on. But again, that really, you know, that pause, I, you know, it was beautiful. Like, you know, I, I was there for my daughters. We created such um, beautiful uh, rituals. Like, you know, we would have candlelight dinner Wednesdays in the house. We would have mommy daughter day once every month. Like, you know, we would spend the whole day. It was like a date with me and my daughter. And I would do that separately with both my daughters. I have two daughters. So I would take her like that day. She would dress up like her you know, in a princess and, you know, we would go all day, you know, we would just hang out doing everything and she would get to plan her day. So again, those type of pauses allows you to be creative. I think being mindful and not being in this autopilot mode in life literally um, allows your creativity uh, to, you know, come out and you're energized. Um, there's so much that happens in that space. I think those are some of the things that um, I would really like to emphasize um, you know, as women, we have to do more intentionally, you know, trying to create that, you know, personal goals, you know, professional goals and family goals, because sometimes the family goals takes over all of it. So again, um, that was something that I was very particular because I've heard growing up in joint family, so many of my women role models, you know, in the household, they would say, oh, I did this because after marriage, you know, children happen and I could not pursue this, you know, after marriage, this happened. So I did not pursue this. So I thought there's if one thing in my life I'm not going to do is put somebody else um, as a responsibility for what I've not done. So I think... Um, I think I'm in a good place. You're in a great place. And it's uh, women like you that validate um, the endeavor that I've embarked on Sarvakun Sampan uh, because um, you show how to take charge of your own life, how to make decisions, how to make your cho choices consciously and intentionally. And there's something that all of us can learn from. I love the way uh, you talk about you know, uh, compartmentalizing and uh, focusing on each uh, of these aspects with equal fervor and, uh, you know, the kind of attention that you give. 
And uh, the other point you talked about taking pauses is so important, you know, without blaming anybody, taking all the responsibility and doing it again intentionally, because you do want to reinvigorate yourself. You do want to recharge and the talent doesn't go away. The creativity, the juices don't you know flow away from you. They, in fact, um, you, you're just, uh, you know, growing more inward. And uh, when you're back to work, I think you are ready to, uh, you know, give out so much more uh, in terms of productivity, in terms of creativity. So all of that doesn't really go away, but it really helps you. Um, so thank you so much for sharing, uh, you know, that great wisdom, Deepa. I really appreciate that. And um, now we move on to our final segment in this journey together, which is called self-care. And here I'd love to know about your self-care routines, if you have any, and, and how do you go about implementing them? Sure. I think uh, my self-care routines, um, I think I would say that definitely surround yourself with, you know, people that you can be yourself. Um, you know, yes, professionally, you know, having that intellectual stimulation is important. But at the same time, um, I think, you know, reconnecting with my bachelor friends in 2015, 2016 time period was one of the best thing that has happened because like, you know, even during the pandemic, we were almost meeting every week, like, you know, virtually we were reconnecting and we do trips together. Uh, when I was in India for the brief period, you know, we would go longer trips, like a week to Manali um, or, you know, a couple of days to Mahabalipuram or like, you know, things like that. So I think really uh, allowing yourself the time to spend with friends you know families is important and I also I'm so close with my cousins so we were our besties growing up so I think that is also another thing that we have started going on trips together like annually just um, the cousins with my cousins uh, leaving the children behind you know just us and things like that so that's really I think traveling really uh, energizes me um, and on a daily basis, at least, you know, spending 15 minutes to one hour on yoga and meditation, I think that really is helpful for me to, um, you know, in, in such a distracted world, like, you know, bringing that mindfulness is not easy. You know, I have to work very hard on, you know, doing that. So I think these are all some of the tools that I use to bring back that focus and mindfulness um, in my practice. And, um, Every now and then I just take off and, you know, enjoy solitude. Um, I just, it, be it, you know, spending my breakfast on a Saturday morning with myself. Um, I just go enjoy my, my meal, talk to strangers, you know, make new friends and, you know, just enjoy a book. So I think allowing yourself to do those kind of things. Yes, I love going out with my family. But again, at times, if it calls for you to go do it by yourself, do that. Like, you know, again, uh, those are things that I think it's very important because in life, we all embark on beautiful journey of uncertainty. You know, it's important that to realize that we make decisions, some may work out, some may not. Um, but again, when you're mindful and you're self-aware and you're present, mistakes can actually become your friends. You know, you learn from it and you grow from it. So again, um, I would never ask for not making any mistakes or like, you know, being this perfect self, but I would, definitely asks for not not ever getting into this autopilot mode and you know really being that fully energized self i love singing dancing um i've actually enrolled myself in uh, carnatic classical music just this week something that i have always wanted to do um you know was never had a chance so again those are just things that do what energizes your soul i think that's more important I absolutely love that. You know, there's a saying in Hindi, Khud ko khoya to kya paya. And, uh, you know, listening to you, it it feels like you, you're really putting yourself um, first because you care about how you look at life. You care about how you feel in that very moment. So being present and uh, really flowing like water. So you're you're accepting everything that's coming your way. You're looking at it. You're not getting caught up. You're not getting swept away but then you're accepting it and you're continuing the flow. So that is so beautiful. Uh, absolutely love that. Thank you so much, Deepa. Any parting words from you to our audience before we wrap up today's session? Yeah, I, would, I cannot emphasize um, the fact that, you know, each one of us, we are all like my grandma says, like every one of us is, is a unique design that God has created. 
and there is beauty in every design. So um, I think just embracing ourselves and, you know, working towards um, just being kind to ourselves. Like, you know, I think once we know that, you know, we are kind to ourselves, it just expands outside. And to me personally, I think that's more important as a gift to pass it down to my daughters because what I do or, you know, how we behave really is the way of life that they see. So when the children see us putting ourselves first, I think they automatically learn to take care of themselves, both in, you know, in, in their personal life and their professional life. I think um, that's the biggest gift that we can give to ourselves and uh, the family and um, people around us. And, and that's so important. You, you know, I say that because a lot of uh, women, um, you know, blame themselves for uh, indulging in anything that doesn't have to do with their family. There's a, there's a sense of guilt. And uh, like you said, the children really emulate us, you know, like we did the way we were growing up, looking at our parents and grandparents and learning those vital lessons, not from their words so much, but from the way they conducted themselves in their day to day lives. And for women to know that it's OK to put yourself first, to do things that you want to do and uh, not be guilty about it, because that's exactly what your kids are looking at and they are uh, emulating and they're learning from you so if we want our children to be a certain way i think the best way is to do it ourselves so thank you so much for uh for you know uh, sharing that very important message i want to thank you and i'm very grateful that you took the time out of your busy schedule to be my guest and uh, share this wonderful information thank you so much deepa thank pleasure. you so much anu it's it's been a privilege